So we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome to the first I4 Energy Seminar of spring 2013. And welcome also to those from the other campuses, uh, UC Davis, UC Merced, and UC Santa Cruz. Uh, we're very happy today to kick off this, this semester with a talk from Joe Edo. So I will introduce him. Joseph H. Edo is a staff scientist at the UC, um, sorry, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where he is the leader of the Electricity Markets and Policy Group and the Strategic Advisor for the Energy Storage and Demand Resources Department. Joe also leads the program office for the Consortium of, for Electricity Reliability, Technology Solutions, which is a national laboratory university industry R&D consortium that conducts research and analysis on electricity reliability and transmission. Joe has authored over 150 publications on electricity reliability, transmission congestion, power quality, demand response, distributed generation, energy technology market transformation, utility integrated resource planning and demand side management, and building energy efficiency technologies. In 1989, he received both the Crosby Field Award for Best Technical Paper and the Willis H. Carrier Award for the Best Presentation by an Author Under the Age of 32 from ASHRAE. Uh, Joe received an AB in Philosophy of Science and an MS in Energy and Resources from the University of California at Berkeley, so he's one of our own. Uh, he's a registered mechanical pro uh, professional mechanical engineer in the state of California, and with that, please join me in welcoming Joe Edo. You're not supposed to say what date I received that award, <laughs> because now people will know how old I am. Well, thank you very much, Therese, and thank you all. Uh, thank you for having me be a, part a part of the I for Energy uh, uh, series. And um, this is a, a long overdue presentation, uh, because uh, actually the, I was supposed to get this last year, when Gaiman approached me to give this talk, and my schedule was too nutty to do so, and I'm very pleased that he could come back to see or maybe regret what he asked for. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about a project that I uh, completed for uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission a couple of years ago. And uh, uh, for those, if you don't already know, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission now has authority for enforcement of uh, reliability rules across the nation. And at the time they, uh, that they asked us to do this study, they were very concerned about the rapid growth in renewable energy, um, particularly on the bulk power system, particularly in the form of wind energy. So when I talk about variable renewable generation, I'll talk mainly about wind power. Um, and they were concerned about you know, this rapid growth in, 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 in wind power and whether it might cause a reliability threat. And so they asked us to do this study specifically to focus on this question of uh, frequency response. And so what I will do is uh, talk about what came out of that study in kind of a selected fashion. Their study uh, was a large report in and of itself. I won't talk about all of that report. I will share with you at the very end uh, the large cast of supporting technical reports and the website where you can get at them if you have interest in probing some of these topics further. So first I'll try to uh, motivate the talk. Uh, for those of you not familiar with some of these concepts, I'll give kind of a power system frequency control 101 in a couple of slides. I'll then talk about how increased variable renewable generation affects uh, reliability from the standpoint of affecting the frequency response of interconnections. I will then uh, talk about some of the dynamic simulations with studies we conducted of each of the three interconnections in the United States to try to prove out some of these concepts and prove out the usefulness of these metrics. And I'll spend most of my time talking about the recommendations. This work was completed two years ago, and I've spent most of my time in the in intervening two years trying to implement or move forward with some of the recommendations. So a lot of that may be kind of an update on stuff that's happened since the work was finished. And then, of course, I'll talk about some of the resources that you could access to get more information. So um, this, I think, is known by many people. Uh, renewable energy has, has gotten a very big push at the federal legislative level through production tax credits, and talk last year of a national RPS, and certainly indirectly through 
talk about carbon legislation. There's a lot of state mandates uh, directing the acquisition of more renewable uh, power. Wind is among the lower cost of those sources, and it's currently predominant. There are you know, dramatic growth in the installation of wind capacity across the country. Uh, but integrating that wind and putting it into the power system is uh, not straightforward because uh, the wind blows where people don't live. That's why they don't live there. Uh, and so if you want to use the power from the wind, you have to get it from where they live to, uh, from where the wind blows to where people live. Uh, and then you have to uh, deal with the fact that the wind doesn't always blow. And so from a, um, uh, a transmission infrastructure perspective, you know, you got to build a lot of lines to connect the wind. This is a huge institutional challenge. I spent a lot of my time supporting the Department of Energy trying to improve the state of interregional transmission planning. Uh, it's not a technical issue so much as it is an institutional issue of being able to build power lines um, to deliver the wind. Uh, what I will focus on here is on operating the power system with lots of wind and dealing with the intermittency that that wind poses, which is fundamentally different from all the other generation we have on the power system, which is controllable, which is dispatched to a particular set point or power operating point. So an important part of, of the research that's done these days is focusing on the forecasting of wind. What is the variability that you have to manage? Uh, but really the, the, uh, what it comes down to is you have an ensemble of units, some that are more controllable than others, and you have to sort of orchestrate the symphony to uh, uh, get them all to sing the same tune in order to meet load uh, uh, every second of, of the day. And that's really the focus of, of what I'm going to talk about is how you manage that, that ensemble of players uh, to deal with this one particular player that sort of um, doesn't march to its own drummer but follows its own rules in terms of when it's going to give you the power that you have to then use to meet the loads. So this is going to be a little digression into power system frequency. Um, the power system is an uh, integrated uh, synchronous machine. Uh, the motors that are running, the generators that are turning to produce the electricity, they're all spinning at 3,600 RPM. They're all at 60 hertz. And uh, uh, the, uh, the frequency of the AC sine wave is a direct measure of the state of the system from the standpoint of the balance of the load, the electricity that's being withdrawn from the system, and the electricity that's being injected into the system. And so this analogy of using the water level in a container is very apt for exploiting power system frequency concepts. If the inflow on this left-hand side, is there a pointer that they give me here? Say la vie. If the inflow is equal to the outflow, uh, the frequency will be stable at 60 hertz. If the inflow exceed, if, uh, exceeds uh, the outflow, the frequency will rise. If the outflow exceeds the inflow, the frequency will lower. And that's a very simple mechanical. It's much more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. You know, in and out or the reservoir changes levels. So there are two uh, ranges of frequency operation that are concerned to the power system. During normal operations, the system frequency is maintained through very explicit control actions within a very tight, narrow range. If this were a class, I'd ask the question about why that's the case, and maybe we'll come up back to that in the question and answer session. Um, the concern that uh, we have is that uh, the power plants break and, and transmission lines break randomly. And in order to keep the lights on, you have to be able to sort of restore frequency very quickly. And so I'm going to be very focused on, on, a, on what happens when a large generator or a large transmission line is lost and frequency falls precipitously and uh, you have a series of control actions which try to restore the frequency so the bounds of frequency are much wider, frequency is going to fall much further and there's some very extreme control actions that you're seeking to avoid operating uh, the first one being under frequency load shedding which means large blocks of customers you know entire regions of California are turned off in a last ditch effort to try to restore the balance between generation and load. Or in the extreme, when that fails, the generators take themselves off to avoid mechanically damaging the turbines themselves. 
And the philosophy there is it's better to be able to restart after the blackout than to destroy the machine trying to prevent the blackout. And so what I'm going to be very much focused on here is these contingency situations where something bad has happened and you need to sort of restore frequency quickly in order to keep the lights on. And the frequency response, more broadly speaking, refers to that process. And it's different both in the amount of frequency that you have to operate over and in the time scale that you have to exert those actions than normal frequency control, which is a minute-by-minute -minute type of balancing activity that goes on continuously. And I'll explain those in the next slide here. This is the anatomy of a, of a frequency response event. In the top, I'm going to show frequencies evolution over time. On the bottom, I'm going to show the different control actions which stem and restore frequency over time. And there's two different time scales. Uh, the first 30 seconds, which is the critical time in which frequency must be arrested or blackouts ensue. And then this restorative period in the minute time frame when you're kind of restoring frequency and trying to rebalance the system. So what happens when uh, there's an immediate... Im so when a generator is lost, there's an immediate imbalance between the load generation balance. You have less generation than you have load. Frequency begins to fall. The rate of decline is determined by the inertia of the power system, which is a function of the total installed generation and load that is connected at any one time, uh, instant in time. That, uh, so depending on how big your system is, depending on how much that imbalance is, that will determine the rate of decline. That decline at this point can only be arrested by the actions of what's called primary frequency control. These are autonomous distributed control actions that are exerted by generators responding to directly to frequency through something called a frequency droop. It requires the generator to both have some room to move, not be loaded up to the top because there's no place to push up, and also to have a governor uh, which allows it to sort of increase its output in direct response, in direct opposition to the amount of frequency deviation from the nominal value. These actions must take place in the first 10 seconds in order to arrest frequency before it has declined to the point where some of these more extreme actions that I showed on the prior slide take place. They will stabilize frequency at what we call the nadir of frequency. And the key here in the analysis that I'm going to be doing is to show that the nadir does not go below, let me go back a slide, the highest under frequency load shedding trip point. You want, do not want to get to this point. So you want to arrest frequency up here. And you can see immediately because it's this opposition of forces here that where this nadir is formed depends on how much of this you get up and how fast. And so this is the focus of what I'm going to be talking about. Once the nadir is arrested, if you have more juice in the tank, frequency will actually stabilize at a higher value. And at this point, slower forms of frequency control, some that are more familiar to you if you study the wind literature, this is called AGC or regulation. Secondary. This is centrally dispatched uh, commands to generators to move up in response to the deviation in frequency. These actions take 30 seconds to 10 minutes to be effective. Much too slow to arrest this free fall of frequency that happens when you immediately lose generation. So again, what I'm trying to do is establish the primacy and the essential role that the primary frequency control provides in arresting the drop in frequency and preventing blackouts. One secondary frequency control has, has, has allowed the, the um, frequency to come back to the target value you have what's called tertiary frequency control, which is generators being moved up and down to restore the reserves that provided secondary control and the reserves that provided primary frequency control. And basically the idea is you want to position yourself for the next unplanned contingency, which could take you down. And so again, it's a sequential set of actions uh, and primary frequency control for the purposes of this discussion is the most important of the three. So um, this work, uh, we developed a series of metrics to measure the adequacy of primary frequency control. The first is kind of a lagging metric on primary frequency, on frequency response. Current practice is to measure frequency response based on the amount of generation that's lost, the number of megawatts that are lost, and the deviation in frequency from the starting point at A 
and the settling point at B. The reason for that definition, you know, and this is, you'll, you'll see immediately, this is kind of a second best measure because what I'm really worried about is whether this point is going to cause under-frequency load shedding. Is because the traditional methods for monitoring the power system take a snapshot of the system only 4 to 10 seconds. So you can't even observe this with the current generation of, of monitoring technologies. That's changing. We can talk about that later. So this is the only observable point you had once frequency was restored. And so that's why the traditional measure was based on, on the uh, current generation of monitoring technologies that's used to operate the grid. In our report, we proposed uh, using a new metric based on Nadir. This is what you're worried about. That's what you should be measuring. With the new generation of synchrophaser measurement technologies, we should be able to measure this more accurately in the future. The second uh, set of metrics that we uh, uh, d d defined were the amount of primary frequency response that's provided by these sources of primary frequency control. And what you can see is it's a time-varying metric about how much power is being injected at each time step. And so you can see, in order to arrest frequency, depending upon how fast frequency is falling, a function of the system inertia and the amount of power, that, the amount of power imbalance, that will dictate directly how much primary frequency control you might need to arrest frequency at any given point. And so in this report, we outline a method for establishing the adequacy of primary frequency control. We ask that you determine what is the contingency that you're concerned about, what's the largest loss of generation event that you want to protect against. You want to then decide what's the highest setting of under-frequency load shedding that you want to avoid tripping. And you want to determine how much margin you want to have between that highest shed point and the frequency nadir that you're going to establish. And that will define explicitly and directly your requirements for primary frequency control, both how fast you need to deliver it and how much you need to deliver. And that's the methodological contribution of this report, is to outline that process. So now what I want to do is talk about how variable renewable generation affects frequency response. The first uh, phenomena, uh, which was something that people were very concerned about initially, was that it will change the inertia of the power system. It'll change the rate at which frequency falls. And the reason for that is that all modern wind turbines are electrically coupled to the uh, power system through essentially a power electronic interface. That power electronic interface effectively decouples the inertia that the wind turbine has through its spinning blades and contributing to the inertia of the power system. So it's basically a zero inertia contribution. And so if you have a lot of wind, it's displacing the generation that would otherwise be serving that load. And so you're basically withdrawing a certain amount of inertia that would have been provided had rotating generators, uh, conventional generators, been providing uh, meeting that load. And so you're concerned about loss of inertia which would mean that this, this free fall would happen even faster. And so, you, and, and, and so you would need even more of this. We find that to be a minor effect at the levels of wind that we've been studying. You can envision a system which has you know, extreme amounts of, of wind power or inertialess sources uh, in which this will become a bigger problem. But certainly this wasn't going to be an issue what we, what we saw. What we were more concerned about is the second effect which is, again, the wind is displacing generation that otherwise would have served load. And all the wind turbines and the incentives that are given to wind turbine uh, operators is to run at max output. That means you have no place to go if uh, you have one of these kind of frequency events. In addition, most wind turbines don't have governor control. that They can't have that. So what you might have is a situation where the introduction of a lot of wind would displace the conventional generators that had a governor, that had headroom, whom you might have otherwise been relying on to provide you with this primary frequency control. You might have lost some of what you were hoping was there. This is a, an effect that we studied very, very uh, explicitly in, in our simulation studies. A another effect which I think we've brought to the fore through the work that we've done for the first time is um, that uh, you'll, by displacing this generation, and by replacing it with wind, it's not necessarily a one-for-one -one substitution because, you know, again, the wind's blowing where the people are not, and the generators are not necessarily where the people are. And so to deliver the primary frequency control, you have to rely on the existing network of the transmission system. 
So you have to do actually a transmission system analysis to determine whether you can deliver the primary frequency control. You might have enough primary frequency control, but if it's in the wrong place, you're going to pop one of these transmission lines trying to deliver it very quickly. So there's a deliverability analysis in addition to a, a, an adequacy analysis that has to be conducted. The final effect that we uh, uh, examined, which I think was very, very underappreciated prior to our writing this report, is that in normal operations, in order to keep frequency here, you're relying on slower forms of frequency control. You're relying on these secondary frequency control actions. Okay? And so, this, so if you've studied these wind integration studies, they talk about how much more regulation do you need? How much more load following do you need? To the extent that you have under forecast your requirements for those regulation requirements, to the extent that frequency deviates more than your secondary frequency control can correct for, you begin dipping into these primary control resources automatically because it, the inadequacies in secondary control are manifest in deviations in frequency. If these deviations in frequency are greater than the secondary resources can handle, then the primary frequency control resources are going to start getting activated to respond and try to restore frequency. And the concern is here that if you've under forecast these secondary, secondary frequency control requirements, that you may have nothing, and you start predating, you start you know, eating into your primary frequency control reserves, you may not have enough primary frequency control left for when the really bad event happens, which is a sudden loss of generation. And so you've used up this precious resource, which is the only way that you're going to get out of these very extreme situations. The other thing our, our study clarified is that many people were very concerned about the rapid ramping of wind. Uh, um, and what we try to show in our study is, you know, that is a very important operational consideration, but it is not the same kind of a frequency response event as a lo sudden loss of generation or a large transmission line. You know, loss of a generator or a transmission line, that's in a second. That's in an instant. These ramping events take minutes or hours to evolve. I will talk about an interaction between that of those types of events and this concern about the secondary frequency control, but it is not a contingency that is the same as the sudden loss of generation, and we were able to clarify that with this work. Huh, this is a funny picture. I didn't think this was in here. This was the picture I was supposed to put in here. So what I'm going to now talk about is the simulation studies that we did uh, to try and demonstrate some of these concepts. In these simulation studies, we will talk about both the effect of more wind and changing system inertia, and we'll talk about the effect of wind in potentially displacing primary frequency control reserves. We will not talk so much about this effect, and I'll give you an example of how this effect happens that uh, can't be studied with the kinds of simulation tools that we used. So what we did is we got uh, the system models that are used by each of the interconnections to do these kinds of planning studies, and we ran them through a number of worst-case scenarios. So the worst-case scenario for this displacement of primary frequency control uh, is typically at night. So what, at night, what nighttime means is that the system load is very low, and in most of the U.S. that means when the wind is at its maximum. So that means you have very little bit left for the conventional generation to serve. And that's the same conventional generation that you have to rely on for primary frequency control. So the concern is under these very low load conditions, high wind conditions, do you have enough reserve left with this remaining set of generation to arrest frequency in your worst contingency? So it's again, you know, these guys are in the power system, they're like, they're like kind of like, the, they like to worry, you know, so like, like, what's the worst thing that could happen to me? So, you come up with these kind of worst case scenarios and if you can show you, know, you can survive, then you feel a lot better about you know, kind of uh, running the power system. In fact, the rules are all set up around assuming the worst and demonstrating that you, you're going to be able to do it. So we got these system models uh, from these different entities. Uh, the acronyms at the end are the, uh, the specific dynamic simulation modeling tools that these simulations are set up to run in. These are the exact same things that the planners use. Now, there's something that I want to say about this, which is it was very important for us to use the same tools the planners used to do this demonstration because the idea was to show them that they can do this stuff themselves and not to look at a reduced form system or a simplified system. The limitation of doing this 
is that these are very detailed models that require you to specify the operating characters of every generator and every transmission line. And so we were limited in the amount of wind levels we could study to what was already in those models. Because what we didn't want to do was say, you know, study a 50% wind scenario, which would require us to both hypothesize where that wind generation would be located, and then even more controversially, you know, hypothesize whose transmission line would be built to serve to bring that generation to load. There is tremendous, as I discussed in my earlier slide, this transmission planning question is a very political question right now, and we didn't want to become mired in the politics of transmission planning to demonstrate what is essentially an operational issue for the operation of a power system with large amount, a large amount of wind. So that limited the amount of wind that we could study to the levels that were already assumed in these models. So um, let's talk what we found. So this is a simulation finding from the West in which we made two assumptions. We studied both a high reserve and a low reserve case. The high reserve case refers to a situation where at night, you know, your load is low and the, the rules of the Western interconnection require you to have a minimum amount of observe, reserves online at all times. And so that's what the low reserve case is. The fact is, because power plants don't turn on and off so easily, many power plants are just sort of kept online but run at low load at night. So they actually have lots of reserves. So we have a high reserve case as well. And these are the brackets around them. And then we run the cases for different amounts of wind being turned on at different, at different times. And so this is for the sudden loss of uh, what the Western interconnection considers their worst contingency, which is the loss of two big nuclear power plants at Palo Verde uh, at the same time, which is about 2,800 megawatts. And so what this simulation result shows you is that even under these low reserve cases, oh, I, I forgot one thing, in the West, the highest uh, uh, trip point for under-frequency load is 59.5. So if you can stay above 59.5, it's all good. And so that's what we show. Under any of these levels of wind, on these very uh, bad conditions of, of low reserves. So that's a good story. You know, the, w the West is going to be okay uh, with those levels of wind and these amounts of reserves. And that uh, translates to about 3% of the interconnections to electricity requirements in 2012. This is a little more complicated. This is the high reserve case for the West. This is the low reserve case for the West. These are the plots of how much primary frequency control is being exerted by the governors in both cases. I didn't have them separate for each case. This is under the low reserve case, and this is under the high reserve case. And what this shows you, there's a couple of things I want to point out here. One, the rate of frequency decline is about the same under either of these cases. And what that means is that this changing amount of wind in terms of displacing system inertia is not a, that big a deal at least over the ranges of, of, of wind that we looked at. What they emphasize, however, is that this is under the high reserve case, so that leads to this result. This pink ones are the low reserve case, which leads to this result, and I'm sorry that they're, they're basically the identical slide. This is demonstrating it's, it's how much primary frequency control you exert determines where you're going to arrest frequency. You exert more of primary frequency control, frequencies arrested at a higher place. And also, when you have high reserves, you have higher system inertia. So the slope is a little bit, a little bit flatter. Under the low reserves case, less generation is online. The slope is a little bit steeper. You have less reserves. The nadir is formed later and at a lower point. So what these slides are attempting to illustrate is that this primary frequency control that's the story. You got enough primary frequency control, it's going to be all good. You don't have enough, going to be a problem. This is the basic story of the entire study. Here's what happened in Texas. Texas is really interesting, and for those of you who are fans of demand response, you're going to really love this one, because Texas gets half of their primary frequency control from demand. They have under-frequency uh, relays on loads that participate in their ancillary services market, Texas actually has rules that limit uh, the, uh, uh, the interconnections uh, uh, um, um, purchase of these reserves to ha about half the requirement because, you know, load basically bids zero price. They always get selected. And so what you see here, and this is a very dramatic example, is this is just a, a presentation both of the primary frequency control exhibited by the governors 
and by the effect of the load dropping immediately. So what happens is this is a huge jolt of primary frequency control. And it's really been instrumental in Texas. And think about Texas. Texas is, you know, like one-tenth the size of the Eastern Interconnection. It's about, it's less than one-third the size of the Western Interconnection. So it's a small system, comparatively speaking. So the same amount of loss of load, you know, two big power plants, that's a, on a percentage basis a bigger portion of that interconnection. You know, because the size is so much smaller, the inertia is so much lower. So when you look at these frequency plots in Texas, it's really steep. And you can see that this load uh, uh, effect is an important reason why they're able to keep the lights on in Texas, because it's a very rapid injection of primary frequency control to stem the very fast falling uh, decline in frequency that results when you lose a big generator. So this is good news for the fans of demand response. Demand response can be as good or better than governors in some cases. Uh, this is a less happy story, and this is a source of stuff, work I'm doing now. When we use the Eastern Interconnection model, and we try to replicate it a known event, we got the red line. It said frequency would be arrested here, and this is what happened. We had synchrophaser measurement devices in the field when that big event happened. It was actually a historic event. This is what they told us. This is the recorded of. So we couldn't reproduce reality with the Eastern Interconnection model. And a lot of my work in the last two years has been to work with the Eastern Interconnection entities to try to fix their model so they can do these studies more, uh, uh, with more confidence in being able to reproduce what they've actually seen. So now I'm turning on to my recommendations. One of the studies that we did was to look at the frequency response. Remember that metric that I told you about, the kind of current metric? It's in megawatts per tenth of a hertz. It shows that the frequency response to these interconnections has been declining over time. And so the concern uh, that's led to a lot of, uh, of work in the industry is to sort of understand the causes of that. It's sort of what has led to this behavior. You know, the models think you're going to do this. The observation is this is what actually happens. Uh, and so... Uh, I've been doing a lot of work supporting the interconnections to do more analysis of their frequency response, tune up their models, and uh, in fact, uh, I'll go on to the next one. So the next recommendation, so this is, you know, you should study whether this is a problem for you. Industry is doing that. So that's good news. The second thing that we found is that the rules, that reliability, the reliability rules that are, are should be, are requiring you to have adequate primary frequency control are imprecise in their specification. And these are, these are the reliability reserves that you're required to have. Regulating reserve, these are the online uh, reserves are um, um, here up. These are offline. These are ones that must be able to respond in 10 minutes or less. These are what are called spinning reserve and non-spinning reserve. Non-spinning reserve is offline. Spinning reserve is online. And you have rules about how much spinning reserve you must have. And you have rules about how much operating reserve you must have, which is this. And you have general principles about how much contingency reserve you have. But none of the rules actually say how much primary frequency control you need to have. And primary frequency control is going to be provided by any online resource that has headroom and that has an operating governor. So you can have other online reserves other reserves that are online that you're drawing from, or you could have the ones you called the spinning that you're drawing from. But interestingly, you can have spinning reserve online that doesn't have governors, that doesn't provide this response, and that's actually allowed under the rules. So one of the things that's happened since this report is, is NERC last December balloted a frequency reserve, uh, frequency response standard that will require adequate frequency response from all the interconnections. And so or my colleagues and I have been doing a lot of work to do the technical analysis of these kinds of things to try to help them establish where that standard should be set. Uh, NERC has voted on that in December. It will go to their board of trustees this week. If the board of trustees votes it out, it will go to FERC for ratification and to a public comment process. And if FERC ratifies it in the spring, then we'll go into a field trial 
demonstrating that this reserve can actually be uh, implemented and measured and compliance can be demonstrated, and we'll be supporting that activity as well. So those are two very good things that have come from this study in terms of trying to bring up the awareness of frequency response as a concern for reliability and to sort of look very closely at the rules that currently govern the provision of frequency response to try to get them fixed. Now that there may be requirements for frequency response, those of you who are fans of markets, you could envision frequency response products being procured competitively, and uh, that will provide value to those who are providing them now and to those who would seek to provide them with, with innovative technologies in the future. So that's the third recommendation, which is you should expand the capabilities. And so one of the easiest things to do is to look at the existing fleet of generation. It turns out one of the things we do is we surveyed all the generators in North America for NERC to find out, you know, do they think they have a governor? Is it operating? How is it operating? And you find out, you know, all generators, first of all, have a governor. But in many cases, they're just turned off. And for many, many cases, they're trying for reasons that no one can actually explain. One of the people we work with does generator certification. He goes to these plants to demonstrate that they can perform according to the NERC rules. And he goes, how come the governor is turned off? And the operator says, I don't know what that was. And so they push the button, and the governor is turned back on. So, you know, a loss is, is not through some will of willful malice on the part of the generator. Some of it's just an educational question. There is a very important issue, though, which is that generators are often under contracts to put out a certain megawatt output. And so you can have a secondary control loop, which after the primary frequency control is exerted, says, oh, you've deviated from your set point, go back to the set point, i.e. take away the primary frequency control you were contributing to help keep the lights on because you've got to meet this contractual obligation to have constant output. So that's a, that's a bad thing, and so we're working on, on rules to try to address that as well. Uh, the other part of this is to expand the capability of demand response. You see in Texas that half of their demand response, half of their primary frequency control comes from demand response. Uh, and I work with a lot of folks at a lot of the labs and universities who are showing that you can do these from any, other, all kinds of end use appliances. Anything that's capable of sensing frequency, and as Alex will tell you, you can sense it right at your plug. So there's no reason why you can't do it in the, your own home. Um, you could also expand the capabilities of the renewable generation itself. There's no reason, and in fact, all uh, modern wind turbines have the option to have governor type of controls installed on them. You've got to address the financial disincentive, however, which is having free frequency control on a, on, a, on a wind turbine means feathering back the output from full output. That means foregoing revenue. So unless you can compensate, you know, you're not, no one's going to give you this stuff for free. So you've got to figure out how much you need. You've got to put a value on it. And you've got to sort of go out and, and try to get it. And then finally, there's a lot of advanced technology that could provide this, this kind of uh, service as well. Four, um, we, we feel in, in particular, and this is that there's a limitation to these simulation studies. And that the real issue with a lot of this variable generation is, is short-term forecasting and prediction and operating procedures that posture your system to be able to respond to these unplanned wind events. So this is an example of, uh, of, uh, of what happened in ERCOT in one, one period. So what you have here is the amount of wind falling pretty fast three times that day. Then you have what's going on with system frequency here. Frequency is falling as the wind output is going down because they're trying to get generation up there. You're trying to meet most of that, of that fall in frequency with secondary control. Okay, you got to this point here at this point of the day where you've run out of secondary control. So you started using primary control. This is called the rapid response reserve. This is what they call primary frequency control in Texas. They actually dispatched it. They just said, turn it on. We've got to stop frequency. So you, now what I'm not showing is that they're bringing up other generators that are also contributing to this, and that restored the frequency. So you're okay, fine, middle of the day. And so the secondary goes back down. You can dispatch, you know, this is the tertiary stuff that's coming back on, so you can bring these guys back down into this, this uh, even point. You had another wind ramp event here. It looks like you were fine. You know, you didn't even use the secondary. You had enough other resources online that you could generate uh, the powders. Then you had a third one again here. And again, you had to dip into this primary frequency. So this is that, that fourth effect that I was trying to describe to you earlier. And this is a real-life demonstration of this concern about if you don't have enough other stuff, 
you're going to start eating into the primary frequency control. And that's why it's a very important concern to have adequate tools to predict these kinds of wind ramps so you can have enough secondary frequency control or load following so you can always keep this reserve of primary frequency control control available when you these bad uh, if you had a loss of generation event at that time and that requires better operating tools better training better forecasts etc fifth recommendation is that these are the, these are plots of the frequency response of all the interconnections this one is the east it's not for this obviously are different events this is the west this is texas and here you can see how fast frequency falls in texas compared to the east which is so much bigger which is, you know, frequency control is a feature of all uh, interconnections. And as the composition of the fleet changes, it's appropriate to begin examining whether you have enough frequency response. And so I'll give another example. When this study was written, there was a lot of interest in more nuclear power. Nuclear power is typically dispatched full out, and by agreements with the NRC, it does not provide frequency control. So here's another source that's on the system that's not contributing frequency control or frequency response for that matter, potentially displacing the other sources that you are relying on. Same kinds of procedures can be used to study that, same techniques, same methodology. And that's the kind of proactive approach that we advocate and which I think is starting to take hold in a number of the interconnections. There have been a number of studies done of frequency response of the interconnections, of individual entities within the interconnections, inspired by the work that we did for FERC. So that's kind of where I'm going to end. I'm going to just sort of tell you what's in these reports because um, this is where the really, really interesting stuff is. This first paper was written by the person, these models here, these dynamic simulation models, PSLF, PSSE. Mr. Underhill wrote those models for GE twice and for Siemens PTI once. And he wrote a primer on power and frequency control concepts that is just a wonderful, wonderful textbook if you want to learn more about these control concepts. Um, I, I'm trying to get him to turn it into a book. Uh, the second one is work that my colleagues did uh, using tools that my uh, consortium has developed and that are used by NERC to monitor frequency and the interconnections to actually do the analysis that led to these results here. Uh, the third paper is written by the fellow who is the author of the control performance standards that are used by NERC to determine how much frequency control each interconnection, each balancing authority must have. If you know the NERC operating procedures or operating rules now, these standards are called the Control Performance Standard 1, Control Performance Standard 2, CPS 1, CPS 2, as well as the Disturbance Control Standard. He was involved in the original committees that developed those. And he basically talks about, you know, in the old days, Everybody had a governor. Everybody had it enabled. We never had to worry about frequency response. As a result of restructuring, we've had to worry about it because no one wants to provide anything for free anymore. And in fact, because our rules, you know, we assumed everybody had it, we never had to write a standard about frequency response because we always assumed that we would have enough. Now we need to be more explicit. He was very involved in the drafting of this new rule that has just been voted out. This third, uh, fourth piece are the actual simulation studies that we conducted that I showed you some examples from. And the fourth one, the last one is a very interesting paper by my colleague up at the lab. She's a statistical physicist who did sort of a, a bottom-up analysis of the variability of wind and load. And what she showed is that wind power vari variations in wind power follow a power law rather than a, a Gaussian law in terms of the distribution. And all the studies that have been done to date about operating under lots of wind have assumed a Gaussian distribution, which means that they have under-forecast extreme events, which are exactly the events that we're concerned about for these power uh, control uh, uh, situations. She's going to continue that work, and we're in the process of talking with a lot of system operators about trying to incorporate work into their short-term load forecasting activities. These are all downloadable in the public domain. I encourage you to go to them. And with that, I will conclude and take some questions. Dave Watson, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, great talk, Joe. Thank you. Um, 
With increases in uh, use of gas-fired turbines and l lower gas prices, uh, how do you think that will change the equation and uh, are newer uh, combined cycle gas turbines more uh, responsive, uh, in, in other words, able to ramp up and down more quickly, and can you uh, modify existing gas turbines so that they're more responsive as well? Um, one of the uh, great things about my project was working with John Underwell because he worked with GE Power Systems for many, many years. And he was very blunt with me. You pay them, they'll do it. You know, there is now a whole class of GE combined cycle turbines which advertises their fast ramping capability. You know, it's just you tell the manufacturer what you want, you tell them you're going to pay them for it, they can make these things do whatever you want them to do. So there's not a technological limitation in terms of the turbine technologies to be able to provide this kind of frequency control. And retrofitting other ones? Retrofitting other ones might be harder. But let me just say that in terms of primary frequency control, all generators have governors on them. Whether they're enabled, whether you've run them in a way that allow them to provide this program, that's a, a discretion of the operator. Not, uh, but it, it is every generator that you can buy. You can't buy without it. Let me put it that way. Okay. Uh, Joe, what uh, per, what is the percentage of uh, wind power? Is the percentage of the total uh, generated power in the U.S. Is there a, just a, roughly what what the what is the percentage? I used to have those numbers at the top of my head. You know, I think it's still on the order of 2 or 3% in terms of total generation, you know, as a fraction of total energy generated. Installed capacity is a little bit higher. So I would say, you know, um, maybe 7 or 8% of total installed capacity. Because, you know, the wind doesn't blow all the time. So usually you assume a capacity factor of about 35. So that's a rough translation there. Much higher in Texas. I should maybe I, I should have said that you know. The reason why we had to do three different simulation studies is because each of these electrical interconnections is electrically asynchronous with one another. They are synchronous within the interconnection, but they are asynchronous with respect to one another, and that's why we did three studies: one of Texas, one of the West, and one of the East, because within the East they're all one machine. Within Texas or the, the air cut part of Texas, they're all one machine. And within the West, it's one machine. Joe? Uh, yeah, Ron? Yeah. Great, great talk. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, the use of demand response and the different uh, modes of regulation that you were talking about and, and maybe related to the success that they've had in Texas and try to classify what are they using to get the good response that they're See. Well, you know, and from my perspective, demand response, you know, particularly managed as an aggregation of demand responders, can provide any of these frequency control services. You know, it can provide load following, it can provide regulation, and it can provide primary frequency control. And there's a lot of demonstrations going on around the country, and in fact, in many of the markets, Jason can tell us about this, many of the markets, demand is actively participating in providing regulation services. So I don't see, you know, there are barriers to entry that we're doing a lot of research on to try to address. Um, a fundamental part of it is trying to reveal the value of demand response. So until there was a standard for primary frequency control, there won't be a market for it. Until there's a market for it, people are going to get paid for it. And so... Uh, uh, that will determine the, the rate of development of, of primary frequency control from demand response. In Texas, they have a market for it. They allow you to do it. In other markets, it's not, it's not quite as mature. Praveen? Yeah. Or, oh, I'm sorry, Alex is next. Yes, uh, Joe, uh, uh, really interesting. Uh, have you thought at all about frequency excursions caused by abrupt loss of large load as opposed to abrupt loss of generation. In particular, I'm, I'm thinking of the, um, the earthquake warning systems in Japan causing the loss of hundreds of megawatts sure, of load sure. in the, the train systems. And now we're talking about installing that in California. Are we going to have, I, I don't know what happens in the other direction if you suddenly lose 500 megawatts of load. Well, two things. Um, 
Typically, the kinds of low loss events that we're talking about are small compared to the large generator loss events that people are concerned about. And um, from the, what I've seen, the loss of generation is much more frequent and a much more routine occurrence. And that's why you know, they already have these spinning reserve rules. But there are over-frequency relays, certainly, for the keep the generators from going too fast. So you, you could hypothesize a situation where if there's a common mode failure of a lot of load. Uh, you know, and, and again, you know, this is all about sort of like uh, how much insurance do you want to buy? You know, what are the, you know, are, we, are we planning for the earthquake all the time as opposed to you know, these, these generators break every week. You know, something goes wrong. You know, uh, uh, we built a one of the things we did is we built a notification system for NERC that says when these frequency events are happening. You know, and it sends out a uh, sends out a pager alarm to uh, you know this selected list of people. I get one of those every other day. You know, now they're not big events, but you know these things. You know, there's hundreds of generators out there, and there's something breaking all the time. So it's not unusual. Um, you got to give the to a uh, Praveen to next after after you. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so you mentioned that currently the renewable energy um, machines on the on the grid don't really participate in the frequency response so far. They're generating at 100%, and there are not a lot of economic incentives uh, that they would participate in these frequency right. response measures. Right. Um, are there already any kind of regulatory reforms which say that they might not operate at 100%, but 95% or so to move up and like, who's regulating that? Is that FERC so on the So Texas, level, which has or? the greatest frequency response control problems because of the smallness of their system and the largeness of the events compared to the size of the system, they have a requirement that every winter and must have an operable governor. Well, at this point, and so they in principle could participate in providing their rapid reserves. They don't mandate that they do so because they set a, a target, they have a market, and they procure it. But they do require... Uh, every every uh, wind generator to have a governor, operable governor, so they could potentially participate. Yeah, so that, those rules are set on the interconnection level, and not at, at the national level of FERC. Uh, so, well, they could translate into rules at NERC. They haven't yet. Uh, they would typically be done start regionally, and then move up if if that was determined to be appropriate. Is there anything magical about 59.5 versus 59.2? I mean, I can't imagine Hawaii being able to meet your standards. That's a great question. I was hoping you would ask something like that because the reason for tight frequency control in interconnected power systems is explicitly for commerce because if you're deviating from that 60 cycles, that means somebody's generating more and somebody's generating less. And the idea of tie line control between interconnected systems was you each keep your nose clean. Everybody matches their own generation with their own load. I mean, they could buy it from somebody else, but as long as you could hold it at 60, that meant that you were in balance. The moment you become out of balance, somebody is serving your load or you're serving somebody else's load. And when money becomes involved, you want to be compensated fairly for it. So that's why all interconnected power systems have this very tight frequency control requirements. It turns out, in terms of equipment damage, you can go a lot lower than 59.5 before these turbines get damaged. And if you want to pay the manufacturer more money, I'm sure you can go even further down. All island power systems, which are very small inertia, right, because they're small, isolated systems, um, they have wild frequency excursions. You can see the data for Ireland, which is connected to, to the rest of Great Britain with a, with a DC line, which effectively decouples it. You can look at Hawaii, and you can just see the, these excursions go all over the place. Uh, and it's really, they don't care. You know, the clock, I mean, most people use digital clocks now anyway, so they don't worry about the clocks going fast or slow. And so, uh, in principle, now, of course, there's all these systems that have been set up around this tight frequency control regime, like the under frequency load shedding relays. But in. Excuse me? You put audits transactions. Oh, sure. They used to do that back in the 60s and 70s. They used to do that, and they're doing more and more of that, you know, but, you know, it's called inadvertent exchange, and you're supposed to, 
And a lot of the NERC rules are set up around you've got to pay back in kind, and as long as you keep your nose clean on average, I mean, that's what the control performance standards are all about, on average showing that you're in balance and not leaning on your neighbor. But it's impossible to hold 60 hertz all the time, and it's impossible not to be leaning on your neighbor some of the time. It's just the nature of the beast. The question is how much and for how long. Great question. Okay, I think last question. All right, Merwin. Thank you. <clears throat> Joe, you found in this study that the dilution of inertia in the systems you looked at didn't have a scary impact, but the way you stated it <clears throat> sort of implies there may be a place where it becomes so diluted that it will have an impact. Another unknown in this, it seems to me, is the change in the customer load from traditionally an induction motor type load to more and more power electronic load, mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. as more and more photovoltaics get on there. And so I don't know what the inertia... A couple of, the of comments load. there. So, yeah, that's what I want to know. What, where are we going? Is anyone studying it? And I Any am. projections? Oh, you're studying... Okay. So uh, two things here. Um, there are inertialist power systems. Um, another project I work on is called the CERTS microgrid. And uh, it's all power electronics. And you, you manage frequency directly. You know, it's a droop that you program in, and that's how we balance load and generation. So you, you can envision these, these situations. Now, load does have a frequency response component. The motor slows down when you go below 60 cycles. And so what I don't show in here is in addition to primary frequency control coming out of the governors, there's about one-sixth the amount coming out of motors slowing down. And, and, but if you have a motor that has a variable frequency drive on it, uh, you could actually see the reverse effect. Some of those motors are designed for constant speed, so they're going to take more power when you want them to be actually slowing down. So there is a different interaction with new types of load, uh, particularly those with power electronics. And we're doing a lot of research both on it from a, not so much from a frequency standpoint, but from a voltage standpoint. I guess that's it. That's it. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. Hope the food was good. <laughs> <laughs>